Hey guys, it's Graham. What's cracking? Uh, pardon the shaky video. My kids broke my tripod, so I'm actually holding it right now. It's a little bit steadier than just holding it in my hand, but I wanted to do another video for you, even though I had one hit the airwaves yesterday. Uh, it's rare enough that I read a book that I get really excited about, that I'm really impressed by, that I just want to share with everybody, and I figured, you know, why don't I just kind of channel that and share that excitement with you guys, and it is this book right here, Bust Hell Wide Open, uh, by Mr. Mitchum. It's, um, it's a biography of Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was a Confederate general, who, uh, if I'd heard of him earlier in my life, his name didn't really stick with me until about two years ago when uh, all those race riots were happening and um, statues were being vandalized and torn down all across the country. Even statues of men like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, you know, not just Civil War era men and not just Confederate men. It was it was happening everywhere. Um, you know, and I had friends that were on opposite sides of that. There was a, a statue of General Lee that was removed from, I want to say, a, a courthouse or a state capital in Virginia, which, um, you know, I, don't, I didn't agree with that decision. But, you know, I don't live in Virginia. Nobody cares what I think. And, you know, a lot of my my friends who were you know, kind of of that same political persuasion felt the same way, like, you know, don't don't tear these statues down. That's the first step towards, you know, editing and, and amending history. And, you know, it's still a hot button issue today. Um, you know, I, I get why people feel one way or the other about it. That's neither here nor there. But the, the thing that sticks out in my head was uh, one of my friends, Dan, who's, you know, more or less aligned with me philosophically, said that uh, one of the few generals that he wouldn't support um, lionizing is the wrong word, but, you know, commemorating with a statue was this Nathan Bedford Forrest said that he was, uh, an actual monster guy who did bad things and killed black people and, and all that stuff. And I was like, Hmm, you know, I should eventually read up on this guy. Um, the only things that I really had read about him were in other civil war books where he was just kind of mentioned in passing as this guy who was uh, an absolute beast on the battlefield. The Union feared him. Some of them thought he was just absolutely unstoppable and indestructible. And he had a talent for uh, making his troops numbers seem greater than they were and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, I figure in the military, that's a skill that you would want to have on your side, right? But uh, the only other thing that was really mentioned was the fact that after the Civil War ended, he joined the Ku Klux Klan and the Ku Klux Klan, Klan was running around killing black people. Um, and so that's the, the general picture that I had of him was that, you know, he was this guy that joined the civil war because he hated black people and he wanted to preserve slavery. And then when they lost, he was mad. So he went around and he still killed black people because that's who he was. Um, the picture that Mitchum paints of him in this biography is very, very different. And he opens the book by saying he'd read a bunch of other stories about him, stories, you know, accounts, but they were more focused on his, his military genius as it were, they had a lot less to do with the life of the man himself. So he set out to write a biography about Nathan Bedford Forrest. And as he dug extensively through the records that we have and the accounts of his, his life, he came to realize that the popular picture we have of this man is wildly inaccurate. And he goes to great lengths to you know document conversations and letters and correspondence and you know original sources and all that stuff to show you know who he really was what he was really about and how we came to have the popular incorrect assessment of him you know supposing that everything that Mitchum puts forth in this book is correct you know because I I'm going off of his research not my own this is the one biography that I've read of of Forrest um, you know, he, he was a great man. He did happen to fight for the Confederacy and before the Confederacy, he was active in the slave trade, you know, which is completely antithetical to human liberty, which is one of the bedrock foundational principles of this country. And one that I very fervently stand for, and you'll never ever hear me defending the institution of slavery. Um, the best thing that you can say about people who were involved in that trade back then was, you know, how how well they treated the slaves that they dealt with compared to the standards of their time. And, you know, by that measurement, Forrest was very good to the men and women that he bought and sold and traded. You know, he even would encourage their their literacy and their education, despite his own literacy not being that great and his education not being that great. He wasn't this 
abnormal monster who went above and beyond the standards of his time with how you know cruelly he treated blacks you know he like i said he did deal in the slave trade and that's that's an evil that still exists in parts of the world today and i hope one day within my lifetime to see it completely abolished but the point is that uh you know if we're if we're trying to get rid of the presentism with which we view the past and try to look at it as you know what was common at the time and what did he do relative to that you know it is what it is when he joined the confederacy it had more to do with the fact that uh, you know and this is a popular view among southerners and specifically the ones that uh, that enlisted with the confederacy to secede and fight against the union they viewed lincoln as the aggressor in uh, you know that, that he made the first move in in what would become the civil war that uh, you know he encroached upon the south and they fought back for their own sovereignty you get into the the numbers of it the economic side of it um, you know and Mitchum highlights that he talks about the fact that you know the the south was x percentage of the population of the country but they paid a vastly disproportionate amount of the taxes Granted, that was off of non-staple crops like tobacco and cotton, whereas the North, you know, grew all of the food that they ate. You know, the, the South grew things that weren't needed, but were very valuable and very expensive, and everybody was hooked on. You know, as, as much as the North might have had a uh, moral opposition to the institution of slavery, they didn't really have a problem with wearing Southern cotton and smoking Southern tobacco. So, these issues are never as clean and cut and dry as we in the moral 21st century vacuum would like to think that they were. Uh, a comparison that I frequently make with friends of mine when we're discussing this is, you know, consider the digital device that you're using to watch this video right now, a phone, a tablet, a computer. Where was it built? Probably in a third world country, more than likely in China. And where were the materials gained for its construction? very likely through uh, underpaid or involuntary labor. You know, what's the world going to think of in 150 years if, you know, the, the People's Republic of China no longer exists in its current form and they look back and say, wow, you know, people think that they were opposed to slavery in the 21st century, yet they were using all these devices that were built by slavery and cheap labor. It's, would we want that same standard applied to us in the present day that we in the present often tend to apply to the past? But I'm getting into the weeds here. Um, you know, Lincoln was only elected with under 40% of the popular vote. Not that the popular vote is what determines the presidency, nor ought it. The Electoral College, that's a subject for another video, and, and it's another institution that I support. The point is that they viewed him as this man who was brought in by a, a minority of the population of the overall country, and then he immediately became an aggressor against them and their interests, and so... They went to war to protect their way of life, which is predominantly the reason that anybody goes to war. So Forrest enlisted for those reasons. And throughout the course of the war, he had, you know, black troops under his command. And, you know, as the war dragged on, you know, Mitchum gives an account of when he told his, uh, his enlisted black troops who were slaves. He says, you know, if, if we win this war, if you guys fight with us and we win this war, I'll free you. If we lose it, I'll free you anyway. You know, his, his attitude towards blacks was far different from the, again, popular conception of him that, you know, he thought that they were less than anybody else. Um, the part of the book that I was most eager to get to was was the end, was the post-war chapters. On audio, it was only eight or nine hours. I bump up the speed a little bit. I tend to do that when I listen to audiobooks. I was very curious to see what Mitchum had to say about Forrest's time as a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And I think he was very fair and even handed with it. And he went so far as to you know, not advocate for it, but explain why its original inception, like its original version, appealed to Forrest and then why he later left it when it became more commonly what we know it to be today. Um, it was originally a, uh, a nationalistic institution that was dedicated to the preservation of the Constitution of the United States, which is a completely defensible position, but then as as more people joined and other outside interests came in and took hold of this budding power structure, it became a, a more racially based system, uh, a more racially based group, and he wasn't on board with that, and he left. So the, 
the assessment of it, you know, as I mentioned before, the one in that uh, that book that I read that talked about Civil War era figures, the assessment of it where it says that, you know, Nathan Bedford Forrest fought for the Confederacy and then after the Confederacy or after the Civil War, he joined the Ku Klux Klan and the KKK went around killing black people. All those individual things are technically true, but it paints a picture of Nathan Bedford Forrest hating black people so much that he joined the KKK after the war to go and murder them all. And the facts as Mitchum presents them in this book show that to be inaccurate and even go so far as to show uh, times when he met with um, members of a Baptist church. I'm already forgetting in what town it was, but he, uh, oh, man, the, the quote when this, when I listened to the quote as I was just at, at work this morning, it just made me think like, this is the kind of thing that this man should be known for. The fact that he, he wanted to put the conflict between blacks and whites in the past and you know he, he wanted them all to be considered members of the nation as much as any whites were you know we are we are one people we have one flag we are one country and it is if if all that bears out to be true which i have no reason to think that the research mitchum did is inaccurate if all that bears out to be true we're doing a grave injustice to the memory of a man who wanted to make amends for his role in the division of the country during the Civil War. He wanted to put all that behind him and wanted people to know that he didn't view blacks as less than whites. Um, Mitchum even documented how after the war, when uh, Forrest got involved in different business deals, um, mainly to, to do with farming, you know, buying land and then hiring some of the blacks that had worked for him and hiring other blacks that they knew, uh, you know, he, he tended to be a little bit over generous with his pay and that was one of a couple of factors that contributed to some of those businesses that he had kind of going under, you know, droughts, poor crops, things like that also factored in. But he, according to this book, was not against the success of blacks in, in post-war America in the 1860s and 70s. And in fact, dedicated a great deal of his own personal capital in time and intangible resources to helping the ones that he knew improve their situation. Um, this is, I mean, this is an example of who we all should be. Um, you know, I think that's pretty plain and straightforward. The fact that we, we should all want to be part of one nation. We should all be compassionate towards each other and we should all be able to admit mistakes we've made in the past and we should all have the grace to allow other people to admit mistakes that made. You know, we're, we're so hung up on this cancel culture era that we live in that you know, we, we couldn't possibly forgive somebody for a mistake if we saw social capital in reminding them of that mistake, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I found this book to be incredible. I, I found the account of his life to be just very, very powerful. You know, he converted to Christianity near the end after the long insistence of his wife, who, you know, she was always a devout Christian. And he, he thought that Christianity was great for women. He thought it made her a, a great and appealing woman. And then, you know, his experiences in the war, I wouldn't say that they necessarily softened him up, but they, they gave him a fuller sense of being that kind of drove him to, you know, wanting that relationship with God that his wife had. And, uh, that played a key role in the view that he took then of other people, especially the view that he had of, of blacks and, you know, wanting them to, to move forward and, and be one nation, you know, white or black, regardless of, of any of that. So, uh, man, I could talk for another 14 minutes on this if, if I really put my mind to it, but I'll, I'll leave it at that because Mitchum's words and his construction of the uh, information that he found and the research that he did, merit their own study. If you've read this book, let me know what you think in the comments. Um, and if you haven't read it, man, go grab a copy from your library. I've got an Audible subscription and it's one of those books that was uh, included with the, the membership. They've been doing that a lot more over the last couple of years, I guess. It's not one that I would have originally gone to pick up. It's just that when I, when I got my uh, Audible subscription set up last year, I saw that they were recommending books like that, like, oh, this one's included, this one's included. And so I looked through a couple about American history, and uh, that's where I found one about Light Horse Harry Lee, who was Robert E. Lee's father. Um, and that biography was thorough. I wouldn't say that it was very, like, gripping or entertaining or inspiring or anything. Light Horse Harry Lee was kind of just a common soldier in the Revolutionary War. It's He's 
he's more popularly remembered because of who his son ended up being. But, you know, the, the point is, that's where I also found this book about Nathan Bedford Forrest. And it sat on my list for most of last year and into this year. And finally, I was like, okay, I'm kind of in between books. Well, why don't I give this one a shot? And after Mitchum's introduction to why he wrote this book, uh, I was very, very intrigued. And then it, it just kept going up from there. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, it's already made my best of the year list and it's only in the middle of January. I'm very pleased with that. So once again, go check out. <laughs> I'm not actually looking at it right here because I'm just shooting this video off the cup. So I almost like burn the world down. No, don't do that. <laughs> the book is called Bust Hell Wide Open. Anyway, that's it for now. Uh, talk to you guys soon. Peace.